behaviour, and we certainly do, then we'll be havering to you. Keep it here on 87.9 Haver FM. Welcome to another Heeds and Hert Scotland podcast. This edition contains a remix of a live interview by our colleague Liam Russell with Scotland's alternative blues troubadour, slide guitarist and songwriter Dave Akari. This interview was first broadcast on Haver FM radio station, a Heeds and Hertz community project that took to the airways back in May 2022. Dave is currently shortlisted in the final live acts nominated for Best Acoustic Blues Artist in the UK Blues Federation's UK Blues Awards 2023 and has had his music featured in numerous BBC TV programmes as well as the popular USA series The Deadliest Catch. Uh, so I'll just get uh, I'll just get straight into it, Dave. Um, yeah, yeah. So I first discovered yourself many many years ago. I was about fifteen, sixteen, uh, when my dad introduced me to to your music. Um, so right. how would you describe your tracks to someone that has never heard your music, never heard the blues, and never heard of a resonating guitar? Am I allowed to swear? <laughs> uh, yeah, I can bleep out. I'll, I'll, I'll try and be diplomatic. Uh, uh, let's just say it's a, it's a little bit messed up. I mean, I, t- to be honest, the bottom line is if I had to pigeonhole it, and nobody likes to pigeonhole their music, but at the end of the day, it's kind of ba- it's based on pre-war Delta Blues. But my official tagline, if you like, is um, national guitar-driven alternative blues that owes as much to trash country, punk and rockabilly as it does pre-war Delta blues. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> now that probably doesn't... But it's, it's a bit of a mix between... It's, it's mostly slide guitar based, a little bit of banjo here and there, a bit, a bit of regular guitar, and it's mostly rooted or influenced by pre-war Delta blues, like, you know, some of the guys like um, Mississippi, John Hart, uh, Sunhouse, Bucka White, Blind Willie Johnson... Uh, these kind of guys uh, but also there's a kind of smattering of like 50s rock and roll trash country e- even probably some punk influences in there as well just really everything but sure. predominantly that blues kind of slide guitar thing going on I guess and how did you uh, how did you first kind of discover the blues probably through playing guitar really I mean as a kid I really liked uh Although I didn't really know what it was, I, I, most of the when I, when I kind of grew up in the late sixties, early seventies, and w- the, during that time, especially the early seventies, was a, a lot of kind of what was termed glam rock. People like Gary Glitter, Alvin Stardust, The Sweet, um, all all these kind of bands with glittery suits and big hair. Well, not Alvin Stardust because he he was more like a kind of nineteen seventies Gene Vincent, but you know a lot of that that sound was almost like slightly commercialised, popified versions of 50s rock and roll and rockabilly stuff. Uh, and I didn't really know what it was, but I liked the sound of it. Um, and I guess that was probably, as well, and I didn't know this at the time, but I guess it's kind of blues-based stuff as well. But it wasn't really until I started playing guitar, maybe I was about 18, I got my first guitar, and um, started off, none of my pals played. I... Uh, and I like different music from all the photo. At that point, everybody was listening to Bloody Human League and uh, Soft Cell and Visage and stuff like Duran Duran. And I, I just didn't... I mean, I actually quite like that stuff now. But at the time, I, I'd kind of gone through listening to heavy metal, to prog rock, to, and then getting into people like David Bowie and, and uh, Lou Reed. And my pals just weren't into that sort of stuff. Then I started playing guitar. Then it was Bob Dylan and Neil Young and Donovan and anything kind of acoustic guitar-like. I suppose now it's like 
the folk listening to Billie Eilish or Ed Sheeran or whatever, you know, if you're going to pick up an acoustic guitar, you're probably going to play Ed Sheeran songs or, I mean, even the days of Oasis being the, the inspiration for people to, to pick up an acoustic guitar, or, or that's yeah. kind of old school now. <laughs> uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure. I'd say there's been like a resurgence of that kind of... Uh, that kind of genre, particularly with with younger people, I'd say it's seen a, a massive resurgence. Um, so, what was your kind of like first big struggle as a musician? Your first kind of real hurdle? Uh, not being able to sing. <laughs> <laughs> not being able to sing, and also not really having any, um, n- never having been any good at at learning things like. You know, I was never any good at languages. Anything that involved memorising shit, I, I couldn't I couldn't do. I was useless at it. At school, you know, you'd have to learn poetry and stuff. I, I couldn't get beyond the first line. So not being able to sing and not being able to le- remember lyrics and not being able to to learn guitar parts. Because j- just to kind of, I suppose I'm, I'm diverting a wee bit off topic, but it's interesting that I, I develop my own style and we'll maybe talk about this later by not being able to do it. And so not being able to sing, not all these hurdles not of not being able to do actually in the long term have turned into good things, positive things. But um, as far as the, the biggest hurdle, I mean, I, I, I didn't turn go full time into music until about 15, 20 years ago. It was always something I, I kind of did in addition to other things. Um, and I did spend a while where most of my self-employed and most of my stuff was was music related, but it was there was a lot of journalism. There was a lot of photography. I was writing for uh, Melody Maker, NME, Q Magazine. Uh, I was taking photos for a whole load of magazines, Pro Sound News, Pro Audio publications and stuff. So I was doing a lot of photography, journalism. Um, I wrote, edit, and designed the music section in one of the local papers for four or five years. I did a lot of graphic design, some web development, all, all sorts of things, mostly music related. So until probably about the early 2000s, I, I always was doing, I did it, all, it was all music based, but it, it, was, it wasn't just writing and performing, it was, it was managing bands, it was uh, running a record label, d- doing that kind of thing. And then I moved back to Glasgow at the... At the uh, probably about 2003 or four, And by default, I, I landed a job with the Musicians' Union looking after Scotland and Northern Ireland. And that was great. I did it for about a year, a year and a half. But I kind of got cabin fever and had to get back out playing um, properly. And But what that did do, it was that let me take a back step from all the other things that I'd been doing. Like I'd had, I was in loads of bands and I was managing a couple of bands in the record label and everything. So I decided during that period working with the Musicians Union that really what I wanted to do was not do all this other shit, but just do do my own thing because I wasn't getting any younger. <laughs> um, so I just decided, right, screw the bands. This is, I want to do solo stuff. And so that almost, the, the Musicians Union job almost gave me the chance to take a step back and say, right, wait a minute, I'm doing all this different stuff, um, and it's all great, and I love it all, but what did I really want to do? I was a bit of a jack-of-all-trades, and I really just felt that, right, it's time to focus on something. So th- there was a bit of a... Th- th- there was never any real hurdles or struggles in that, you know, probably in, in that in that first 20 or 30 years of, of writing and performing music. Other, other, other than try, 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 be able to do it, yeah. <laughs> singing and all that kind of. I mean, I was the only singer in my last band because I was the best of a bad bunch, you know. <laughs> it, it, uh, and at school, it was always uh, you can be in the choir, but you can only move your lips. Uh, failed all my exams. I, I was useless at, at anything academic. Um, I wasn't stupid, but I just, well, I don't think I was stupid. I just wasn't any good at learning in that kind of way. So, but the biggest hurdles probably now are, well, did you know, to be honest, I don't know if there's anything that I would call a hurdle. Being a self-employed and 100%, well, pretty much 100% independent in music, it's like being self-employed in anything, there's kind of ups and downs in it. Financially, it's difficult, um, but it's difficult for Finance is difficult for for most people most of the time, um, so it's not really any. 
what hurdles. I mean, sometimes that you feel that. You know, I, th I, th I was going to say there's gatekeepers, but the days of the gatekeeper are slowly, slowly drifting away. Yeah. The advent of that we we don't need record labels anymore. I mean, you still need to know what you're doing, but you know, it, it's not that you don't need the record label, but you just don't need the person there saying. Nah, no, 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 yes, no, no. And and they're making the decisions about what people get to you. Now nobody can stop my music getting out there. Yeah. And so that's really important. And with all the stuff with Web3 and NFTs and all this kind of stuff, um that 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 level of, of that control hierarchy is going to get even even less because we're not going to rely on governments and legislation and and gatekeepers basically. In, in any industry. So I think Web3 and NFTs, I mean, they're kind of buzzwords at the moment, but that, that, that's going to that's gonna level the playing field even more, I think. Yeah, um, I think it goes beyond that as well. I mean, I think it, that level of control is going to diminish even further as well, uh, particularly amongst the creative industries. I mean, you're seeing stuff like Fiverr rise and people are being able to, you know, finance themselves and make their own income with, with without working for this huge conglomerate of a company where they can't progress, they're stuck in this mid-level management position, you know, no real kind of progression forward from that. And uh, Waiting for I mean, people I, to die or waiting to be the chosen one, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, I think it can only be a positive thing in the in the long run. Um, yeah, so I wouldn't say there there are more um, there there are more challenges I would say than there are hurdles because it's still on one hand, you know, my music as as you know is very niche. It's it it is. It, I mean, you get the odd thing breaking through somebody like C Six Steve, who is blues based and you know is a is a very uh, niche artist now. He he made or he didn't the, the media made his music seem like something new to to the 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 the, the, the majority of the yeah. newer generations who didn't think he sounded just like a mix between John Lee Hooker and Muddy Waters and had heard it all before, so they thought they were discovering something new, and that breathes new life into it. But by and large, on that niche thing, I don't need. I don't need to sell a hundred thousand records. In fact, I don't even need to sell fifty thousand records. You know, if I if I sell two, three, four, five thousand copies of a CD, it's difficult to work it out with streaming. Mm. But you know, on the road and I'm still in the fortunate position that people still buy vinyl because they want a thing, and there are still uh, probably with my music appealing to generally an older demographic, they still want to buy CDs at gigs. They maybe stream as well. A lot of people buy CDs, never take the the, the plastic wrap off them, because yeah. they just want a thing, or they they take the plastic wrap off so you can sign it or write a message on it, because they want a memento. They're not really buying it for the music, but we don't need this huge. It's not like I've got a record deal, and if I don't sell a hundred thousand copies of something, I'm dropped. I'm charging on Destiny, and I only I only need to do you know as long as I can survive and pay the bills. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we do, but. You know that, so there's nobody really in the way, which just echoes what what you're saying. You know, and it's not like there's this old hierarchy or mm -hmm. corporate system that we have to yeah. have to do. The challenge, of course, now is that anybody can do it, but just because everybody's got you know fantastic camera on their phone doesn't make a photographer. You know. Yeah, got, and it's like you know, I, I I'm in my wee studio here. I can do it on a laptop what I used to do in a, you know, I used to run a studio in Fife, and uh, you know when I think of the the money or the the investment in that and the amount of space and equipment and what have you, but what that taught me was how, what microphones to use, how to use them, how to make a room sound good, how to, how to work everything, which mm -hmm. is missing now. So just because people can get their music out there doesn't mean they will and they will do it successfully, but it does give them the opportunity that if they want to, they can learn how to do it. But what what is difficult is is differentiating yourself from the crowd. Going, oh, hello, I'm over here because there's like you know two hundred thousand tracks being yeah launched on Spotify every Friday, you know, or 
<laughs> every bloody day probably you know so how do you differentiate yourself is probably one of the not so much ch ch hurdles but challenges and I've been lucky that you know I started even the full time solo thing traditional media and newspapers and stuff was still quite uh, so quite prevalent and mattered and it wasn't everything wasn't quite as successful so I was about I, I was able to kind of at least kick over the wall and say hello to people and get a start I would hate to be trying to do it now well, uh, it's 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 funny because I was I was having a conversation with someone the other day, and um, you know you go back to like the sixties and seventies, and the artists that we remember to, and and listen to from those eras, they you know they were the best of the bunch because they had to be you know that was it they were they were the top of the line, but these days it's kind of gone full circle and it's. It's the total polar opposite. As you said, anyone can do it. You know, there's so much competition. There's almost an overindulgence of music. You can just access everything at the touch of your fingers. Like, it's it, it's crazy. Uh, yeah, I mean, amazing. We've, got, <laughs> but, we've got some friends that are, um, you know, older and less technically uh, aware and I've just been helping them kind of move over to using Sonos and Apple Music and stuff. And the problem that they're having is they don't know what they want to listen to yeah. because they're not going over to a rack of CDs or a rack of vinyl or cassettes and saying, oh, I haven't listened to that for a while. They've got no real visual reference. Flip side of that, of course, is all you need to do is put in one thing that you like and you'll get suggestions of new stuff that the chances are you will like. So... <laughs> it's, it's really yeah. weird it's kind of there's definitely a, a, a weird plus and minus to all of it I mean, we could probably counter every pro and every con you know yeah so who has been some of your biggest musical influences as an artist and as a performer ooh um, lots I would say I mean as far as the music itself goes I would say probably the Biggest influences are if you took Blind Willie Johnson from the pre-war data of blues, mixed it together probably with 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 that that sort of when I say Johnny Cash or country music, I don't really mean the kind of stuff from Nashville that you yeah. hear now that sort of glossy over yeah. auto and Tarazo, auto tune stuff that all sounds the same and has got the same people playing on everything. But you know, I'm I'm thinking back more to, to people like Hank Williams or or in the modern day people like Sarah Shook and the Disarmers or you know the the more more kind of alternative honky kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um so th th there's a, there's definitely an element, influential element from 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 somebody like Johnny Cash. But the blues I would say for me the the, the style and the is derived from because really once again going back to the fact that I, I, apart from the fact that it's really hard on some of these old pre-war Delta Blues records to actually hear what's going on because the recordings even though they've been remastered and enhanced it's still pretty difficult to tell what's going on because they're, they're quite mushy even if I could tell what was going on the chances are that I wasn't I wouldn't be able to do it technically or musically so I kind of I, I take that and I kind of make my own version of it and do sure. it my way. Um, so I would say, yeah, playing Billy Johnson, probably Johnny Cash. Uh, probably, you know, it's been as much wider than that. It's probably everything I hear, everything I see, everything I experience, all all, all contributes. And it's sometimes it's difficult to pull. I mean, when I write a song, I can't really immediately say where it came from. Sometimes it takes years and they go, oh, I thought that song was just about Oh, you know, and now I'm going to... Yeah. Oh, actually, that's, it's about something after all. That must have been... I must have... You know, some, maybe something in my subconscious. <laughs> so, are there any up-and-coming blues artists that you're kind of keeping an eye on that's kind of piqued your interest? Yeah, me. I'm still up-and-coming. <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> just got stuck somewhere along the way. Uh, no, in all seriousness, uh, what what is happening? That there there is a lot. That there's a there's a very there's a new breed of. And I was going to say post white stripes, but white stripes are really probably like 
20 odd years old now, you know, yeah. but I still think of them as a new band. But there is still, they, they, they kind of almost launched a, an awful lot of the sort of guitar, drums, duo kind of thing. Uh, I've got some pals in the States that I do a lot with when I'm over there called 20 Watt Tombstone. They're a guitar, guitar and drum kind of thing. They, they're, they're kind of breaking through quite nicely. Uh, on the scene, people should listen to folk like Reverend Payton's Big Damn Band, Scott H. Byram. Over here, it's kind of difficult because I feel possibly wrongly. I'm not really that in touch with the, the kind of... You know, when you go to the States and you go to Europe, people don't... Blues has got a different kind of inference. People's perception yeah. of blues is different. I still think a lot of people here... And, and and because of what they're exposed to is it's kind of Eric Clapton, Joe Bonamassa, it's kind of electric and it goes uh, 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 uh. Mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that, but that and, and widdly widdly guitar solos and, and stuff. And in most other places, it, it's what I find hard is that there's a scene for what I do in the States, in Europe, in Scandinavia, everywhere else. But in the UK, when 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 the people I tour with and, and play with outside the UK. When they want to come to the UK, it's really hard because the scene is very disjointed here. Mm -hmm. You've got the regular kind of blues, 12-bar blues, pub blues, playing mostly covers. Uh, and there's lots of great bands like that. It's not for me, but there's lo lots of lots of, um, lo lots of of great music, blues music out there. But I find it hard to say to them, right, well, look, look, I'll help you get some gigs because the, the, the audience... Were, I mean, bands like Left Lane, Cruiser... Um, oh, I'm trying to think of, of, of off the top of my head of, of people that I play with outside the UK but Left Lane Cruiser for us, they can come to the UK and they can play in Newcastle they can maybe play in Glasgow but it, it, it's quite limited opportunities because the, the scene for this what, let, let's just turn what I do and the scene that I think I fit into is, is a little bit alternative I'm probably the 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 most traditional being acoustic or largely acoustic, I mean, it's still step on a overdrive channel from time to time to time. But I, I would say, possibly my approach more than my sound and my songs it, it falls into the into that slightly left of centre, more alternative blues niche that doesn't really is very disjointed. And it's because my audience isn't isn't blues fans. My audience is. I get metalers, I get goths, I get old people, I get seriously old people coming. Sometimes I'll look out from behind the curtain, especially if it's a kind of theatre style gig and I'll see rows of kind of polite people sitting down and I'm like, <laughs> what are they going to do when I start? They've come to see me? Really? And so I've judged them and then I go out and they're all mad for it. So but it's everything from, you know, even like, and, and, and I don't mean kids condescendingly, I say kids, I mean like, 13, 14, 15 year olds. So it's kind of strange. I seem to have managed to bypass the blues tarnish. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's hard to. And I've, 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 I've rambled so much that I've forgotten your question. So I probably haven't answered any questions because I just talked too much. But I can't think what. You, you know, the, the scene here is the, the, the audience is, is very diverse. For me, mm -hmm. so when you when we're looking at, at up and coming stuff, uh, mm -hmm. and for the last two years I've been totally out of touch, of course, because of COVID, we've not really seen or heard. There, there's a guy, there's a guy in Sterling, uh, or Stirlingshire, Ian Donald, who is uh, I just had him open for me in Glasgow a month or two ago, at uh, broadcast. Uh, he goes by the name of the Gator. He'd always be like me. He'd always been in bands. Got got a bit kind of fed up with having to be the the guy that does everything. Got in. He was actually started off as a bass player, but he's quite. A, he's one of these musical guys that, that can get tune out of anything. And he, you know, over the last couple of years, he's got into playing slide guitar, writing his own, and he's he's quite assertive on the scene and enthusiastic. Um, so he's for in, the UK, in Scotland. You know, he's if if, I, if I'm thinking I've got a gig. Who who would I like to open for me? Now, sometimes I like to try and get something that's completely different, not necessarily blues-based or similar to me. But, you know, I, I he's the kind of guy that I would say, uh, he, he would fit well, you know? And he, he's, 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 a, he's a good guy, he's a good player, he's just starting out, 
but but he's doing good. Um, try to think of of other folk in this kind of scene. I mean, there's lots of. I mean, there's people like uh, Christoph Kingfish Ingram coming out of the states. There's yeah, there, there there's there's a lot, but um, in in this a more alternative, more traditional blues. There's still not an awful lot of that come bubbling through here because most people get into blues bands. I mean, there, there was a band in Glasgow that I called, called was it called Blue Milk. Um, oh, Gary Johnson and Three Card Trick. So the, there's quite a good wee scene going on in Glasgow around about um, pubs and venues like the Howlin' Wolf. There's kind of more free entry kind of places. But, you know, so that what you would maybe term the pub scene. But it, it won't be long before these folk gravitate towards you know doing more and more of their own stuff and and, and get out and play you know ticketed venues rather than rather than pubs. Sure. So, what has been your proudest accomplishment as a as a musician? Uh, I mean, there's been highlights, accomplishments. Way back in 1993, my first band won the Alexis Connor Memorial Trophy for Scottish Blues Band of the Year. <laughs> Uh, prob- probably things like me- perhaps I don't I can't really say cracking the states but making you know building things up in the states to, to make it a worthwhile touring and you touring all over the- possibly playing Glastonbury's been was been good but I, I didn't really accomplish that there were more things that I, that I did or came my way or sometimes you know the harder you try the luckier you get with getting gigs done quite a lot of stuff with C6 Steve over the years um, what else has been good? Steve Earle. I, I, I also played with a guy called Toby Keith, but you know, <laughs> bizarre. He's almost like the polar opposite politically to to Steve Earle. I'd rather align myself with Steve Earle. But in saying that, it was it, the Toby Keith show was you know a, a good a, a, a good good experience overall. But I played the Heart of Scotland Millennium thing. I don't know. Are these achievements probably. I'm trying to think what's uh, I've quite a lot of music used in, in 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 TV and film and stuff which has been which has been quite good. I never never ever thought I would see the day where that happened. And I can't say anything about it at the moment, but there is um, one of the biggest names in <laughs> commercial music. There's a new album out soon and uh, I was invited to be he's there's been a film made uh that I'm not sure. I think it's still in post production, but I got uh, it was chosen and I are invited to um, swap some songs around the campfire and drink whiskey with him as part of this film, and um, that Nothing. might hopefully become clear in another couple of months. But I can't, I'm sworn to secrecy, so I can't say anything about it. <laughs> That's totally fine. Um, so if you could collaborate with any artist, dead or alive, who'd it be? I'd quite like to, I'd quite like to see what uh, what Jack White could bring to the table. Sure, I think that's a good choice. Because or or you know, Dan from the Black Keys, because these folk are people that I've kind of. I'm not sure I know what to do with my music beyond. You know, just playing an instrument, and you know, I'm I'm not. I understand production from a technical point of view, but I don't. I'm too embroiled in my own music to say, right, let's take this song and let's make it totally f- mental. Or take this. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, last year I, I put out a version of of one of my songs, that, you know, that had had drums and and stuff, and I just played everything and arranged it all myself, and it, it was all right. I tried to do it again, and I couldn't. I couldn't do it, and I don't know whether I just lost interest in doing it or just the songs that I picked didn't work. I, and it was okay, but it, it it sounded a bit bland for me. It was a bit a bit run of the mill, and generally when I there's an album, the Whiskey in My Blood album, which was recorded at Sonic Pump in Helsinki, I had a couple of Finnish guys playing it. One of the best drummers in Finland actually, and and a bass player, both pals, played on a lot of that album, and and it's quite good, and I really enjoyed doing it. But again, it's just really it was basically like me doing what I normally do and then playing along. And I think what I would like to do with my music is collaborate, or or, or somebody out out the, the you know out, out the dance scene or EDM scene, because what I do I don't want to just play my songs and add things to it. I would like actually to take it and and 
you know, evolve evolve some of the songs. Um, and I think that the, these folk have done that very successfully by not just going out and doing the same old, same old. So I'd, I'd like to collaborate with somebody that I think could could bring or could help me bring a twist and a, a, a different angle to it. So yeah, so somebody like Jack White or some of the, you know, Dan from the Black Keys or, you know, so somebody maybe, a, you know, not Moby, but, you know, maybe, I don't know, I'm yeah. trying to think, I don't, I'm not up on, 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 on EDM and electronic music, but, you know, sometimes I think, I, I did some stuff with Alabama 3, God, God, many years ago now, and I always kind of fancied doing a project that was a bit like, uh, kind of brought together, Kind of what Alabama Three did with you know I made Acid House Country. I would like to make Acid House Blues, but I always felt that the the techno side of it wasn't hard hitting enough, and and also the country side wasn't honky enough. So I would like to take like real hardcore raw blues, and I would like to take some real you know stuff that's going to make people <laughs> pants when it hits when the bass hits a beat hits them in the stomach. So it's sure. extreme extreme techno, extreme hardcore blues and somehow pull just a few elements from them and, and jam them together. So kind of got some of these ideas, but I don't really, I don't have the time or the patience or the inclination to kind of spare, you, you know, I'm, I'm so busy trying to keep the ship afloat mm -hmm. uh, that it's difficult to find time. It's, I think when you're, when you're younger and you're starting out and perhaps if you've got a day job and you don't need to worry about everything being geared towards make sure that there's content going out stay visible, make sure we can we're selling, selling some records, make sure there's gigs coming in you, you, you start not to have time to be innovative anymore and I like even writing new songs I like every time I write a new song, I don't want it to sound like the last one. I don't want it to sound like anybody else. With the result, I'd probably throw like, you know, 90, 95 songs out of 100 in the bin before they've even had a chance because I'm like, nah, it sounds like such and such. You know, so that in itself is hard enough. So to really take it in, no, it's not that I want to take it in another direction. I would like to evolve it and, and create something kind of... So, um... What interests do you have outside of music and songwriting? Oh, I like drinking whiskey. <laughs> uh, I, I like. Uh, I mean, out, 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 outside the business kind of kind of stuff, um, I really enjoy cooking, especially like um, doing barbecue. You know, smoking stuff. Uh, I like you know most. I, I, I like a lot of outdoor cooking so so barbecue pizza and stuff like that but I, I like I, I like cooking Asian stuff so I like cooking and I like eating it as well uh, so I really enjoy that I like mountain biking we live up the east side of Loch Lomond so you know I, I enjoy a fair bit of mountain biking walking about six seven months ago I got into paddle boarding again we live right in the Loch side so it would be a sin not to enjoy the water and get out there so and at the moment I'm doing a we just started the 1st of May a pal along the road the lassie that actually got me in, got me into paddle boarding we we're doing a through May we're doing a fundraiser for Scottish Mountain Rescue on our paddle boards which is interesting <laughs> um, so yeah so I've just got you know I, I like outdoor stuff um, which is just as well otherwise I'd be a total fat <laughs> instead of just a bit of a fat <laughs> Um, so yeah, I like eating, cooking, drinking whiskey. I like. Uh, I, I I still like. I like. It kind of is more intrinsically linked with 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 business, really. But I like photography and film production and stuff like that. But as far as kind of hobby type things, well, yeah, probably mountain biking, paddle boarding, cooking. Sure. And all things. And I I started making during. Um, during lockdown, it kind of got to a point where you, because there's no merch table, really, and because there was no gigs, uh, there was a trickle of stuff online. But a lot of the, the the hardcore fans, they've got all the vinyl, they've got all the CDs, they've got all the T-shirts. So I, I I started learning to make sort of short runs of some some merch just to try out different things. I, I felt I'll do whiskey flasks, but I just want, I want fifty or a hundred. I don't want to have to order ten thousand of them because I'm not going to sell ten thousand of them. But you know, I've been able to do things like making I mean, really bizarre things like 
just was like making earrings, for instance. I don't know if you can see these, but uh, which uh, you know we we sell them at gigs now, but they were selling on like make my own badges, whiskey flasks, leather stuff, key fobs, hats, patches, all, all sorts of stuff, and that has evolved <laughs> into a wee bit of a sideline because during lockdown I got some, you know, it was just a few hours a week helping out in the local village shop here, and I, I realised that they didn't have any. Gifts or souvenirs. And we're the first stop in the West Highland Way, for goodness sake, you know. So uh, I started making, after I'd started doing the my own merch and stuff, I thought, maybe make some, make some fridge magnets and shit. So I just started, you know, so I enjoy, I actually enjoy, that. that's almost a relaxation, is, is just coming up with things like, you know, engraved chopping boards with an epoxy inlay in them and stuff, and make it, you know, coming up with crazy ideas for, 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 for merch of my own, because I can do stuff that, you know, I just make five of and put them online. If people like them, then I just make them to order, you know? <laughs> it's yeah. pretty good. No, I was just about to say, so we're, we're running out of time. So do you have anything exciting in the works? Uh, this film that, that, that I mentioned earlier, I just wish I could tell you more about it. Um, what, what else is... I did a, did a, a song for a... Series that comes out of the states called the Deadliest Catch. I don't know. If oh, it's the, yet. the the it's like the fishing, fishing kind of show. Thing. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I don't know if it's. I don't know if it's been used yet. I was a music supervisor in LA. Just got in touch and asked if I would, uh, if I could do something. Um, <laughs> Bella, not not an awful lot of gigs in the pipeline to be honest at the moment, because it's still been very uncertain, and my USA visa has run out, so I need to start getting that together again. Uh, Bella Drum Festival in the summer, and really we're just just get going to be, watch this space going to be back in the road. Oh, there'll be a new album later this year as well. There'll be a new album probably about October or November time. Cool. So working on that at the moment, just piddling away at it, you know. <laughs> sure. Well, thank you very much, Dave. It's been it's been great talking to you just the last half hour and. You know, developing that understanding of the, the blues and yourself a little bit further, it's, it's been great. <laughs> good, it's been good chatting to you, man. Nice to catch up. Thank you to Liam Russell and Dave Akari for that interview and thank you for listening. For more information on Dave Akari and how to vote on those Blues Awards, live gigs, music and merchandise, simply go to daveakari.com. Please follow our YouTube channel and our Facebook page, hit like on the podcast and get involved with our mission to create, inspire and promote social connections in the How of Fife Haver FM, How Community Radio, is supported by the Fife Communities Mental Health and Wellbeing Fund through Fife Voluntary Action and the Scottish Government.